when it is permissible for women to uncover their heads, then one will plead, why not uncover the stomach also? And after this, one will plead, why not bear this or bear that? In short, there will be no sense of decency left unless people learn to contain themselves <coughs> and respect what is proper and fitting, so as not to go headlong overboard. This is a quote by John Calvin. Now, if any of us were to hear someone talking like this today, we'd probably roll our eyes. What's, where does dude get his ideas from anyway? You may already know the answer to that, which is 1 Corinthians 11. But I have to wonder how many people have actually studied this passage for themselves. If you haven't guessed already, the purpose of this speech is to persuade you that women should wear head coverings when praying or prophesying. Now, I doubt I will be able to convince you of this in 10 minutes, but I hope, at the very least, to help you to think and study this passage out for yourself. First, what I will be doing is looking at what 1 Corinthians 11 actually says. Then I'll be addressing three major arguments against the use of head coverings, and finally, I'll boil this down to a couple points of application. So first off, let's go to the source, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 16. I'll be using the New American Standard Bible here and throughout the course of my speech. Now, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of man, just as man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonors his head, and every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if she were shaved. For if she is not covered, then let her be shorn. But if it is shameful for her to be shaved or shorn, then she must be covered. Now a man indeed ought not to have his head covered, because he is the image and glory of God. But a woman is the image and glory of man. For man was not created for woman, but woman for man. Nor did man come from woman, but woman from man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent from woman, nor woman independent from man in the Lord. And even as man came from woman, even so, as woman came from man, even so man came through woman. But all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it permissible for a woman to pray or prophesy with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is shameful to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is glorious to her. For her hair was given to her as a covering. But if any is inclined to be contentious about this, we have no other practices, nor are the churches of God. We can see here Paul gives four reasons to wear a head covering. The first is the created order. He says men were given authority over women, just as God has authority over Christ. In reference to this, Tom Schenk, the author of Letter Be Veiled, says, A woman ought to have a veiling on because it functions to represent the objection she shows to her authority man and ultimately God. She has the continuous reminder of what her life should exemplify by it. Paul is quick to point out in verses 11 and 12 that he does not infer that men are superior to women. After all, they were put in this authority through no work of their own. The second reason Paul gives to wear a head covering is it is as shameful as going bald. He even states that if a woman does not cover her head, she should be shaved. Actually, Paul here gives a command to wear a head covering. It's lost in most English translations because it's a third-person imperative which we don't really have in English. But this section could easily be translated, since it is shameful for a woman to be shaved or shorn, she must be covered. The third reason Paul gives is honor. He says, by not covering your head, you dishonor your head, period, no buts. He just earlier said that a woman's head is her authority, so that would be her husband or father if she's not married. Finally, Paul gives us a very interesting reason to wear head covers. He says, because of the angels, now this seems to cut two ways. First, as a witness against the fallen angels, and as a witness to encourage the good angels. In reference to this, Tom Shank says, Satan and his cohorts hate the veiling because of what it represents. It reminds them and puts them to shame because of their own rejection <coughs> of Christ's headship. Now let's move on to the arguments against the use of head coverings. The first goes like this. When Paul says head coverings, he's really referring to long hair. So by wearing your hair long, you fulfill this passage. Okay, if that's the case, let's reread verse 7 in light of it. If a woman has short hair, she must have her hair cut short. That really doesn't make much sense. Proponents of this idea are quick to point out, but doesn't Paul say in verse 15 that a woman's hair was given to her as the covering? Actually, Paul says a woman's hair was given to her as a covering. In the words of the Geneva Bible commentators, a covering and such a covering as should procure another. The second common argument brought up against the use of the head coverings is as follows. Paul is merely referring to a local custom which has no bearing on us in 21st century America. 
Now if that's true, let's see how far-reaching this local custom actually was. Throughout the Bible, head coverings are noted as a normal part of Jewish life and culture up to over 2,000 years before Paul. Fast forward 700 years to far away Rome, and we can see on the art on the sides of catacombs depictions of Christian women, all veiled. Head coverings were in common use during, in Europe during the Middle Ages up to the 18th century, as noted by J.C. Wenger, professor of historical theology at Goshen Biblical College Seminary. Head coverings were worn in America up to the end of the 19th century, and head coverings are still worn in the majority world. A friend of mine just recently came back from a mission trip to Romania, where he noted that the women still wore head coverings in worship. Besides this, none of Paul's arguments actually have anything to do with local customs. They all have to do with timeless truths, like the headship of God. But the biggest problem with this argument is basing one's interpretation of scripture off of the sand of historical interpretation instead of the rock of scripture. Now then, the third argument commonly brought up against the use of head coverings is, I can't wear a head covering because my friends would think I was a freak if I did so. First off, Paul says by not covering your head, you dishonor your head. So we need a better reason than feeling uncomfortable to dishonor your authority and God's command. Secondly, the very fact that you are a Christian means that in the world's eyes, you are a freak. If you honor your father and mother, if you bear no false witness, if you keep the Sabbath <coughs> holy, if you love your neighbor as yourself, then really, you're weird enough. And wearing a head covering isn't going to make a difference. After all, Paul already told you who you should be concerned about. And that's not your friends, that's the angels. But lastly, this line of reasoning is simply untrue. We could take an example from Islam. And the nonfiction book, Zaytun, offered, author Dave Edgars details how two Christian young women were converted to Islam. He explains that it all be, they began to get interested when they saw two Malaysian sisters wearing head coverings. So if head coverings are attracting people to Islam, why are we Christians trying to minimize it? By not wearing head coverings, we potentially weaken, the, weaken a witness to Christ. Now then let me move on to points of application. The first one should be fairly obvious. Women should wear head coverings when praying or prophesying. Aha, but now come the real questions. Where is it appropriate to wear a head covering? What age do I start wearing a head covering at? What is a head covering? Can it be a hat or need it be a veil? What is meant by prophecy? In reference to these, I can only lament the fact that I have 10 minutes to talk to you. However, I would recommend going to the source, 1 Corinthians 11. Get a Bible commentator and start studying. I'll leave you ladies with this. So as to avoid dishonoring your authority and God's command, wear a head covering when praying or prophesying. But what about the men? Lots of men like to think they're off the hook when it comes to 1 Corinthians 11. But as your wife's authority, God is going to hold you personally accountable for what clothes your children wear, what traditions your family has, what music you listen to, what church you attend, everything, because you are the spiritual authority in the home. Are you ready for that? If not, why not start by encouraging your wife to wear a head cover? You'd be surprised at the number of women who are unsure what to do with this passage, and thus don't wear a head covering because their husband is non-committal about it. Really, it's your job to make sure this gets done. You are given the authority, meaning you can't be passive. Whether you agree with me or not, I would encourage you to go to 1 Corinthians 11 and study it out for yourself. All men should do their research on every issue. I'll leave you today with a quote from Matthew Henry, arguably the greatest commentator of all times. It was a common usage of the church that women should appear in public assemblies and public worship, veiled. And it was manifestly decent that they should do so. Those must be very contentious indeed who would quarrel with this or lay it aside. Thank you.